um, in different um, uh, different theoretical ways. And so I really look forward to um, hearing people's feedback. Um, I know of uh, the work of most of you, and so this is uh, this is just really a great opportunity for me to um, to hear from from people who know the area. And, and I hope um, I'd be more I, like, please uh, feel free to give me any feedback um, as we go. I'm just going to move on my screen. I've got everybody's um, heads in the middle of everything there. Okay, so um, it is a tradition in uh, Canadian universities. We always start with the land acknowledgement of where we're talking. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, this is really significant um, to me and to my work. So um, this is uh, not simply for me um, just saying the words, but I, I want to talk a little bit about land ownership and how we understand identity um, in relation to my own uh, landscape in a minute. So I would like to acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7, which is located in the heart of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Pakainai, and the Kainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stonely Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Goodstony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of uh, Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. So I have been thinking a lot about how we determine the identity of people uh, on the Anatolian, Anatolian uh, plateau, um, because over the course of the um, uh, over the course of the last few years, I've really started to realize from our evidence that the story we have told ourselves about how populations interacted and mixed in Anatolia particularly as we get into the 11th, 12th centuries is not, uh, is just not accurate. Um, and so a lot of it comes back to understanding how we think about identity and, and frankly to colonialism. And we'll come back to that in a second. But I start with this quote from, um, he's a biblical scholar and classical archeologist, uh, Charles Hedrick. This is a quote I always start with my students. Um, history is a story the present tells itself about the past, and its meaning lies in the interaction of the two. So I want to actually start in central Alberta, in Canada, where I live, and just talk a little bit about how I think about space. Because when I first went out to um, Anatolia all those years ago, 1997, <laughs> Um, I was actually quite struck by the fact that Anatolia reminds me very much of where I grew up in central Alberta. Um, and I, so I'm going to start with a quote from one of our most famous um, uh, novelists, whose name is Margaret Lawrence. Um, and she wrote in an essay called Where the World Began, uh, a strange place it was, that place where the world began a place of incredible happenings, splendors, and revelations, despairs like multitudinous pits of isolated hells, a place of shadow spookiness inhabited by the unknown dead, a place of jubilation and of mourning, horrible and beautiful. It was, in fact, a small prairie town. Now, Margaret Lawrence wrote this about the town she grew up in Manitoba, which was much like any central Albertan town, and I wanted to start here because I think sometimes when we're thinking about the distant past, we we have a tendency to forget that these were the lives of people that moved in cycles much as ours do today. Um, and that we can't always just periodize everything and walk away from it. We actually have to think about how things changed. Um, and so if you look at the map I put up here of, of Alberta, this is a road map from 1937. Um, the big thick lines are the roads that were put in. And you can see this one runs all the way up to, to the capital city of Alberta from Edmonton, uh, from Calgary down here. But if you come over to the side, the lighter lines are in fact the railway lines that were put in in the mid 1800s. And over the course of the 1850s to the 1950s, there was a real shift in how these, to these, um, these towns functioned. Um, and so I just wanna show you two examples of two small towns in Alberta. I always like to use the town of Vulcan because it's called Vulcan and their entire industry now uh, works on connecting themselves with the Star Trek franchise, although it has nothing to do with it. Um, 
but it's a tiny little town that was originally quite well populated and was on the railway um, was on the railway line. It is now a very tiny town. It's in a lot of disrepair, although still a very nice little place to visit. Um, their population is decreasing every year, and currently they have about 1,900 residents. Um, and this is down from quite a large population when the railway was in place. They have one of the nicest little museums I've ever been to, which really traces um, the whole history of the region, the agriculture as this town developed. Um, but you can see how as, as communication and transport changed, it starts to move into abeyance. Now Vulcan has made a name for itself as this place that connects itself to Star Trek. Um, but a lot of the little towns that were established by the railway have now disappeared entirely or almost entirely. Some of them are down to two or four residents. Um, Devon, on the other hand, is a town that is on the main road. Uh, it's the town that I grew up in. Um, it is a burgeoning town. It had about 4,000 residents when I was a kid, and it's now up to about uh, 7,500 almost. Um, it's a planned town and it was established in 1948 as an oil boom town. So it was planned and everything was built. You can see the nice straight roads and, you know, so we have these two stories in central Alberta, uh, one in Southern Alberta, one in central Alberta that, that tell very different stories. And when we, we dig down, we actually get an entire story of how these people created things and were established in relation to other parts of the country. Now, when I grew up, I didn't know anything about the other story here. And this is, I think, the most important part of what I want to talk about today is this, these hidden stories that we don't think about. So um, the, um, the lands in southern Alberta sit on what's called Treaty 7 lands. And I give you here two, um, two different... Um, images. This is an early image of a Blackfoot town in this region. Uh, and then this is the website, uh, and the top of it's disappeared, but uh, this is from the um, um, this is from the tribal reserve that is now established today. Uh, it functions like a small town. Uh, and then Treaty 6 lands in central Alberta, um, Enoch, the Enoch Reserve, and this is an early picture of um, Treaty 6 uh, Cree. Um, and so there's this whole other story. And we're only now beginning to recognize and talk about um, the reconciliation between the peoples because this story was largely forgotten. So we went from these lovely planned streets um, and in doing that, we left out the earlier stories. And so I grew up 10 minutes down the road from this reserve. Um, I'm 51, I did not know anything about this until the last 10 years. I didn't know very much about the reserve. I didn't know anything about the history. And the fact that our lands, the land of the town I grew up on were in fact their lands and they were pushed onto a small, um, this small section with no access to the river. So there's a whole story here about how we colonized the land, took the land. On top of that, there's another story that needs to be told, and this is a story that's only recently come out, that during the Second World War, the government basically took two hectares of land from the Enoch Cree Nation and used them as a place to um, test bombs. When they finished doing that, they walked away. They didn't clean up the land um, and they left them with a land that was uh, full of live ammunition, something they didn't find out until they put a golf course on it and people were playing rounds of golf and somebody came across live munitions. So in the last few years, uh, very recently, they have finally reached um, an, a settlement with Canada who denied everything. Um, there's a wonderful video on the Enoch website about this called The Crying Fields that gives you the whole history of it. But again, there's this whole story of how we uh, had one population, we moved another population and displaced them, and then all of these stories. Now, 
I would argue that this has been very heavily influential in how I think about the towns in central Anatolia. Um, because I, whether we want to recognize it or not, we have to be aware that our views as scholars um, really affect how we isolate and identify things and how we think about periodization and populations. So I think that in some ways, when we come out of uh, particularly Western contexts and we've been trained in Western schools of thought, it's, it's on us to take a step back and start to think about how we approach these periods. And this is particularly thorny with the medieval period because people have different hands in different pockets about what's important and how we identify things. But I think if we don't do this, we, we fall into old traps of colonialism and Orientalism, and then we see a real loss of identity. And I think that has happened particularly for the medieval period. Um, I would say particularly in Anatolia, but also I, I think the Balkans, um, Syriac archaeology has definitely suffered from this, and, and I think even further east um, than that. So I think there's a lot to unpack in all of this. So there are four basic things in terms of this that I, I want to identify before I start talking about, uh, before I start actually talking about the site. Um, first of all, one of the big, and I would call it a kind of colonizing issue, is thinking about what is Byzantine identity. Now, I, I full disclosure, I feel very strongly about not using the word Byzantine. I've left it here um, because I, I don't think Byzantine really means what we think it means. Um, I don't think it really means much. But we are wrapped up in these images of beautiful things. Uh, and so when we say Byzantine to our students or in public forums, this is what we this is what we mean. Icons, um, you know, mosaics. Um, it, we're not really thinking about the fact that ordinary people lived in these regions. When we do think about rural identity, we are reduced to stereotypes. So here we have an image of Theodore of Sicyon who wandered the um, landscape. Uh, and then we have a manuscript depiction of farmers and peasants. So we have sort of very stock views of what rural identity looked like. We also then are stuck with what happens at the very end of um, the period, uh, which is the Muslim arrival in Anatolia. But, um, and I'm particularly beholden to the work of, of Andrew Peacock and Scott Redford here, when you actually look at the arrival of the Seljuks in Anatolia, it's not nearly as organized or as violent or, as uh, clear as we like to tell ourselves, you know, that the Byzantines disappeared when the Seljuks arrived and it's, that's the way it is. Just hang on one sec, everyone. Okay, have a good day at school. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the, um, so, so we mostly, when we picture the Seljuks either don't know anything and they really, interestingly, unless we think about their major monuments, we are um, we are left with very little information about the Seljuks in in a lot of parts of Anatolia. So we're left with these images of the Battle of Manzikert and the takeover, and it's not uh, it's just not entirely accurate. And then finally, um, my favorite, I always love this picture of, of von der Rusten gazing into the distance uh, at uh, Kerkenes. Uh, and um, the excavations uh, at Alishar Hoyek. Um, for the medieval period, this was all largely left out of the wider narrative of everything. Um, and so we get these uh, European perspectives that come and they choose what's important. The Hittites are important. Um, the Bronze Age is important. And, and this is not to argue that these things aren't important, of course, um, but you know, as a medievalist, obviously, I think what's on top is important, but this wasn't always the case. And so um, when you look at the reports from Alishar Hoyek, for example, the um, breakdown of the medieval and Islamic periods, it, it comes down to less material in one volume than I think 
everything he published uh, inappropriately on skull size, right? It's really, really problematic how this stuff is, is conceptualized. It's conceptualized as a thousand or 1500 years where it's all thrown together and there's very little stratigraphy in the early 1920s, 1930s for this material because nobody saw it as important. And just as with the indigenous material that I talked about, um, we make choices in how we present and what we consider significant. But it has left for a much longer period in medieval archeology, span this blank space where we have to try and fit in a narrative that we get from other sources. And so we get these sources from historians, um, which are elite historians writing in Constantinople. Um, as I was saying before the talk started, I'm just starting to work on the fact that there is evidence for Central Anatolia in a couple of epics, one in Turkish, uh, the Danish Mendene, and the, um, the there's a Greek epic. Now, you can't take those at face value, but there's a lot more evidence in those epics for how populations live together, how they conceptualized each other, um, but we don't use those because we say, well, they're epic. It's like it's like trying to create history from the Iliad or the Odyssey. And, and I agree, you can't create history, but you can't leave them out either. So we need to start looking at how we consider this material more carefully. Why? Most importantly, because this is a period where we can actually really carefully trace the resilience and change in these communities. Um, around climate considerations. Are landscape and identity connected? Can we see this through climate? Absolutely. And, and um, this is not a shock to anybody who knows some of my work that I've been you know, working with John Halden and Neil Roberts and in the past on this stuff. But we've got very clear delineations that are connected to the, um, the changes in temperature, um, the climate change that's happening. And so we actually have with the medieval period a particularly important set of evidence for understanding how communities changed. Not how they're destroyed, not how everything was terrible, but how they changed. And so first at the end of the Roman warm period, and then as we move into um, the medieval warm period. So we need to be thinking about how we approach this material, what we can get from this material, um, and really starting to think about this in wider scheme. So to that end, I'm gonna turn now to Chatterhoyek and I want to just show you two images. And first of all, this is, a, um, this is an aerial view of Chatterhoyek in the last few years, uh, taken from one of the hills, which I'll come to at the very end of this talk. Um, and the, um, these hills uh, and sort of the landscape, you can see that there is, this is obviously an agricultural landscape of some significance. People didn't walk away from this kind of agricultural landscape. Populations waxed and waned, of course, but this is the kind of landscape where we do, again, have this sense of continuity. And we can see this regardless in what we're reading, what, regardless in what we're um, excavating, but we haven't really thought about it in careful terms. So the, the, the landscape analysis of this region from the medieval perspective has been largely on a sort of hit and miss basis. And so I have here the map from the, uh, one of the map pieces from the Tabula Imperii Byzantini, um, which, uh, was the volume on Cappadocia, which uh, also included this region. And um, clearest on this map, you can see is the Basilica Thermae in the middle there. That is not very far from us. And in the region surrounding it, there are little sites that have been identified by Hild and Russell as having medieval remains. They missed several. Kerkenes, for example, is not in the volume. Um, but Beyond that, half of the villages that are named on here also have medieval remains um, that are not cataloged because they seem so minor. But for example, the village Mehmet Bailey, not very far from us, has an Islamic graveyard that is full of Byzantine columns, right? 
Um, there is um, the remnants of bits of liturgical furnishing uh, in the village down the road from us called Yazlotash. Uh, there's a there's a big Byzantine stone worked right into the wall of the mosque, which is why it's called Yazlotash. Um, and so this stuff is everywhere. But because we're not seeing major monuments, most of which have disappeared into rebuildings, because that's how this works, um, we negate it and we don't pay attention to what we really need to be thinking about um, in this region. Um, but in, you know, and if we if we think about it in terms of landscape, instead of big uh, monuments, and we think about the resilience model of Gunderson and Holling, we actually can chase uh, a waxing and waning on the Anatolian plateau in the medieval period that gives us a far more nuanced view of how this, um, this all functioned. So in order to do that, I'm a firm believer in starting to use the microhistorical approach where we look at our sites and then we don't compare them, but rather put them side by side and start to think about how each one tells a different story but how the stories together start to be able to put together an entire narrative. And so um, I turned to a quote by Emily Kurt, who, who you know, used this to describe putting together um, you know, ancient material from the Near East generally. And she says, it's an analogy of attempting to write the history of Britain using worm-eaten records from a monastery, a civil service department, a gentleman's private study, and perhaps a section of the British Library, all separated by centuries from one another. We don't have even this much when we're looking at medieval Anatolia. And here I show you the 20 years of pottery I'm attempting to deal with um, in my year off because I know how to have fun. Um, but it's uh, this is how we have to do it. And we have to take a step back and we have to do the labor to create the different stories. Uh, and I'm heavily indebted to this article um, in how I've started to think about this material. Um, I think singularizing the past comes out of the Icelandic School of Microhistories is a really interesting way of starting to think about each site as important as uh, something that can be set as beside other stories. So we turn to the site of Chatterhoyak, um, which I suspect most of you are familiar with. We're, we're, we're not the biggest or the most exciting site, but um, I've been there for 2004 because I work with an amazing team and I I love the Anatolian Plateau. I, I It's where I'm most comfortable. Um, so we have two kinds of micro histories on this site. Um, we have here down on the terrace area, uh, and then up on the mound. And I'm just going to take you through what this looks like and what we've got from the site, uh, and then talk a little bit about what we can do with that information. So on the um, on the uh, terrace itself, we have a house or village complex. Um, the stuff that is identified in dark blue is the earliest stuff, or the for those of you who are colorblind, like my poor husband, um, the darker ones are the earlier foundations. Um, and then I show you what this looks like in section of walls. Um, and part of the reason I want to do that is because this is exactly the stuff that people like von der Austin would have just dug through and taken out as one. There are at least four phases of walls in this picture. And at the very, very bottom, where just next to the measuring sticks here in that red section, um, we had uh, C14 dates that date the very earliest foundations to the Roman period. Um, so we've got Imperial Roman followed by a late antique phase. All of these phases are very nice. They're very straight, they're very organized. And then we have a, um, an intermediate phase, what we used to call the Dark Ages, but I would now call the, the early medieval period. Uh, and then we have a rebuilding in probably the uh, late 10th, um, the, sorry, the uh, early 10th century. Um, and then there's a rebuilding on top of that. And then we know that a nomadic population came through and used the site. So even in the stratigraphy, we can start to see what this microhistory looks like. 
Um, the earliest period is characterized by exactly the kind of nice things you would expect of the um, transition into villa culture. Uh, this is probably late Roman. Um, it was there was um, nice redware associated with it. Uh, we have a nice plaster basin, um, very organized sort of uh, villa culture that comes out of the connection of villa culture from the Roman world, but also local um, uh, local architectural techniques in Anatolia. Um, characterized by exactly the kind of luxury and imported items you would expect at the very end of this period. So nice redwares that are coming from probably the coast. Um, and uh, although there is a pottery workshop at uh, Kerkenes, um, some luxury items like this little lid. Um, and then there is this transition where the walls start to get a little wackier, um, as you can see. Um, and we start to get ceramics that are not as uh, nicely made. This is a local imitation of redwares. Um, I always think it looks like somebody's drunken uncle tried to decorate that. Um, and this characterizes a con continuity in the str stratigraphical levels where people are continuing to use the site. But as they're reconstructing walls, as they're adding things on, we see the addition of a stable, we see things are not quite in the straight lines they once were, and they're sort of doing the best they can. This then transitions into a reconfiguration of the entire site um, on the terrace, where we once again get very nicely constructed walls, nice plastered floors, um, we get nice objects, now I say that, but I also want to be clear, this is still an imitation redware. Um, and one of the things that's very characteristic of our site, and this becomes very important, is there is no fineware after about 700, like none. I think in the 20 years I've been digging out there, we've hound exactly four tiny pieces uh, all on the mound from probably the 11th century. There's no fineware. So we're looking at locally made pottery. Does it mean that the site is um, in declining circumstances? I would say in the 10th century, no, because you've got this kind of nice architecture, but they don't have imports. But that has previously been characterized as a site that is in difficulties. Um, and I think we have to rethink that narrative. We have a huge kitchen that's put into use here. There was a big tandoor oven in here uh, and it was full of metal artifacts. And these metal artifacts seem to have been reused by the nomadic population that came through. Uh, so we had these artifacts that many of them seem to date to probably the 11th century, but then there's uh, evidence for reuse in this kitchen area. So we've got this whole sequence on the terrace that gives us a sort of glimpse of what these villages look like. Um, after these brief nomadic periods, we have a sort of abandonment. And so, um, sorry, I, sh I should have said, this is this comes from that last period as well. Uh, I found some comparanda that suggests these come from the Seljuk period, although I would, I, I would love any feedback from anyone. Uh, there's these uh, ceramic vessels that are locally made in that very top level, um, which seem to mirror the earlier Byzantine ones. But again, um, if anybody's seen anything like these and can give me some feedback, I'd love it. Uh, and we get one Islamic coin. Uh, it's not in great shape. And sadly, it was a surface find, but I'm pretty sure it's Danish mended. So we've got, we've got this sequence as it runs around the terrace. Now on the mound, we have a slightly different, um, we have a slightly different sequence. So um, the mound itself, we've now dug a very large portion, particularly around the outside. Uh, the center seems to have very little in it. So we've done a couple of test trenches in here, but haven't come up with very much. And this big divot in the middle um, was the result of somebody who thought this was a Phrygian tumulus and took a backhoe up here um, at some point in the 90s. 
So um, there's, <laughs> this is just kind of a mess in here. Um, it's not a Phrygian tumulus, obviously. Um, here's just another view of that. Uh, and again, I wanna draw your attention to its placement in the landscape. Again, it is not the only site within I site of this town. So here's our site. Over here is our village. Here's Yaslatash, which obviously had Byzantine remains. Um, when you look to the south, you can see across the valley. So we're looking at a site that, although it feels isolated now, was not isolated in the medieval period. Uh, and Anthony Loricella and um, Laurel Hackley have done some uh, survey in the region and they, they, have, they have yet to publish these results, but it has confirmed um, that there's a lot more going on here in terms of villages and small settlements than we have really taken the time to think about. So the mound itself has a very different trajectory. Uh, on the south side of the mound, we have this very weird Roman room. Uh, my working theory is it was some kind of religious um, structure. We really don't know. It was very nicely built. Um, the wall was put in later. Uh, its original construction was um, it had painted plaster and was these very beautiful little bricks, which sadly are not uh, stamped. On the other side of it, um, and we made poor Tony dig this when he first came to us, there was literally nothing. Um, so the Romans seem to have been using the south side for some sort of religious or guard purposes but nothing else. They did not establish anything in the center of the mound. Um, so this, this room becomes reused in the next periods, but um, the Romans were up here, uh, and by this I mean the Imperial Romans, but not for very much. This was true of the late Romans as well. Uh, we get a little bit more up there. Um, you can see there's some sort of monumental entrance. Um, I think there was a road that led down the west side of the mound. Um, we get a rock and it, the pictures of it never come out, but uh, on one of these rocks, there's a big engraved cross. Um, so they may have been using that room, but again, not much else. So why they didn't use this is probably because they had no need of defense in this period. It's kind of a nuisance to go up there. There's not really any reason to. Um, and so they're using it for some sort of ceremonial purposes, but that's that's about it. Nothing happens up there until now circa 950 to 1060. And I'm excited to tell you for the first time, I can actually be clear about these dates. I don't have to hedge because we've got some C14 dates um, back. So we know the fortifications were built in this period. Um, I'm still working out the stratigraphy, but all of the, um, all of the earliest uh, um, dates for this uh, come from about 950 to about 1020. There's a couple um, later, uh, later ones as well. So this is really exciting for us um, because this is what I have suspected, but because there's no pottery um, and because the finds are so spotty up here, we've been, I, I've been hedging uh, for a long time, but it does, um, it does look like it's, it's nice to be right about something anyway. So um, this is what the fortifications look like. Um, these major fortifications are added to over the course of this time. The foundations seem to be about uh, mid 10th century. Um, there's a massive storage building up here that again uh, is originally constructed here. You can see the nice straight lines and then added onto. Um, there's evidence for using this for uh, storage, um, for uh, processing of things. So we have a small forge up here. Um, we have drainage uh, and lots of ovens and hearths. Um, so, and tons of grinding stones. So there's no evidence in this earlier period of them living up here. This is entirely being used as sort of safe area for processing for storage, um, sort of rough safe, safe, you know, like safety. But I, again, in 950, 
other than the earlier attacks uh, by the raiding parties coming from the Abbasid Empire, we're not looking at a vast number of things threatening this particular settlement. Now, again, this is different from what happens at places like Amorium, uh, but this settlement itself, it had some safety, but it was not a particularly uh, worrisome um, period for them. Now, by the early 11th century, that changes, and we start to see them panicking a little bit. So we see the addition of more um, guard towers, uh, not particularly well constructed. Again, you, you can see I, when things get hairy, the lines go completely. Um, we see in 1045 on the south side, uh, around 1045, we have a seal from Petros Chrysoberges. Um, uh, and this is found in relation to one of these added on guard towers. Um, the stratigraphy for this was not super, but um, the date is pretty clear. And also the fact that it actually names the theme we're in is really significant. Um, by the mid 11th century, they are panicking. And we know this because they start to build houses up here. Um, so we get this little mud brick enclosure up here. Um, we get what we think is our only evidence for religious activity at the site. I always think it's funny that I wrote my dissertation on the church altar and I'm the only Byzantine, Byzantine archeologist who doesn't have a church. But anyway, we think this might be a little chapel um, largely because of the fines associated with it. Uh, by the mid 11th century, trouble does arrive. And so here's the house before and here is after. They had blocked it and then it all burned. So something terrible happens at the site. And this is old news for those of you who know the site, uh, but we know something did happen that was terrible because there was an entire stable full of animals who were locked up uh, and simply died where they were. And this population of animals included pigs. Um, there were, I think the final count was two separate bodies in amongst these animal remains. Um, and um, so uh, there was, um, you know, a couple of people who were left behind to tend the animals. The majority of people who were left behind though were soldiers. And so we found the remains of a couple of soldiers in those guard towers, uh, including things like a little bit of chain mail, um, swords, um, stirrups. And this is always one of the great mysteries, but it is, I think, probably the smoking gun as to what happened to these people. Uh, because this is a, not a Byzantine cross. This is a St. Peter's cross. It hangs upside down and it's a Western artifact. And we have in fact found two of them. Um, so in the um, mid 11th century, there's an attack on this site, which traditionally we have blamed on the Seljuks. However, the dates are too early for the Seljuks. This is before Manzikert, and any Seljuks in the area would have been roughly nomadic. Um, they wouldn't have been large raiding parties. This is not how that actually worked. And this uh, is a very problematic artifact. But if you go to the historical texts, what you find is a bigger problem were raiding groups of Frankish mercenaries. And so it's entirely likely that this site was attacked by Frankish mercenaries. The population ran away expecting to come back and because of the upheaval in the region, they couldn't. So when the Seljuks do arrive, and here we go back to these images of the Seljuks, uh, the fact is that um, I'm almost done because I'm realizing I'm running out of time. Um, the Seljuks come later. And they reuse parts of the mound, um, but not all of it, uh, mostly as stable uh, things. Um, we find some really interesting Seljuk artifacts. This is my favorite thing. I love this little lion um, and his little face, but the workmanship uh, is very parallel to things coming from Northern Mesopotamia. I don't know what it is um, other than a little lion. Uh, and if anybody knows, I would be delighted. We've all debated for years about what it is. Um, and they used parts of the mound as a garbage dump. So this looks nice and clean now, but in fact, this population seems to have cleaned up a bunch of stuff. 
uh, and just thrown it over the side into this. And so we found a huge collection of artifacts, uh, mostly broken Christian artifacts that had just been collected and tossed in a basket over the side here, uh, either to be melted down or just because they needed to be put out of the way. Um, again, another of these weird St. Peter's crosses, but also some Byzantine, um, some uh, artifacts that suggest that there were at least representatives of the Byzantine uh, military complex there as well. And then finally, um, we have um, one sort of anomaly at the very bottom of the mound. Uh, and I think she bears talking about, um, because I think what you, actually see here is a transition from um, a site that falls into disrepair because of these mercenaries. I suspect people slowly trickle back over the next 50 to 60 years, not in large numbers. And then the Seljuks arrive from uh, Eastern Turkey as nomads. And that's definitely what the evidence suggests. Um, and interestingly, the only burial we have is this woman, a careful burial. Uh, she's right at the base of the mound. Um, she was about 45. Uh, she's pointing towards Mecca. She has one of these nice little pots at her hip um, and a very deliberately placed rock on her neck. So who was she? And is this evidence of these populations settling? Um, there's no evidence for any type of terrible set of events under the Seljuks arriving at this site. And even if this was a woman of uh, that there was some fear about, um, she was still given a proper burial. And so I, I think it's important to sort of deconstruct all the bits and pieces and start to create a new narrative about this. Um, and so I, I finish here with the vision of the site again, and whoops, uh, and I just want to come back. This is the hill on which we take that view of the landscape, where we can see that whole landscape. There's a small mosque on the top of that hill, and I, I worked there for 15 years before I finally uh, got somebody to take me up there because it's a, a, a long way up. Um, there's a small cell, a small Muslim cemetery up there, and um, the sort of folklore in the village is that it was um, Seljuk heroes who were buried up there. Um, the story they tell parallels Christian stories from the region, but when you actually get up there, it's mostly women and children who are buried up there. Uh, and so there's, um, from definitely the, the Muslim period, and so there's this sort of layering of stories and when we actually look at the stories, we get a very different narrative than the Roman Empire fell, it all went to hell, the Seljuks killed everyone. We actually get a much more nuanced um, view of this. And so uh, just to finish, I just wanna turn back to, and, and I, I won't show it here, but I've got the link here if anybody wants to see it. Um, I wanna turn back to the indigenous stuff that has really influenced me. Uh, I work with Dr. Ginn and, um, have helped him with his Songs of Justice project. He's a religious studies scholar who specializes in uh, some indigenous um, religious traditions. Um, but he's really been looking at the stories we tell in terms of indigenous landscapes um, and how we're not always getting the full story. And so um, he has a song called Hercules, which is actually uh, about a plane. Uh, which was called the Hercules, uh, and about a village in um, northern Winnipeg that was forcibly depopulated, or northern Manitoba that was forcibly depopulated uh, by the government. And the story that is not told about that, and yet when we see the story, we get a different narrative of how Indigenous populations were changed in um, uh, in Northern Canada. And so working uh, with Indigenous scholars has really helped me reconfigure in my brain how we think about these landscapes. And so um, I owe a great, uh, I owe a great debt of thanks, uh, particularly to Craig for helping me think through um, different ways of landscape. And, and I would in no way ever co-opt um, Indigenous traditions. Um, but I do think that the understanding of the way um, Indigenous historians and scholars think about things can only do us good in helping us decolonize the way we think about um, our world. Thank you very much. <laughs>